This week on Wealth Track, with the power of the Federal Reserve behind it, Gluskin Chef's influential economist David Rosenberg predicts inflation is coming and deflation is fleeing. What his big call means for investors is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. What has been one of the defining financial trends of the last three decades? We have covered it numerous times on Wealth Track, and no, it's not government shutdowns, although there have been 18 of them since 1977, including the most recent one. And it's not the looming October 17th deadline for the federal debt ceiling limit. Congress has raised the debt limit 15 times in the last decade alone. Probably the most significant economic development of the last 30 years has been the submission of inflation and the concomitant decline in interest rates. For that, we can thank former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, who took office in 1979 when inflation had become a defining and destructive force in the economy. In the 1970s, the Consumer Price Index was regularly increasing at 10% a year. Volcker waged war against inflation by tightening monetary policy, including raising interest rates, and the economy went into what was at the time the deepest recession since the Great Depression. Well, it worked. Over the 80s and 90s and into this decade, inflation has declined and so have interest rates. But ever since the financial crisis, current Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke has been waging his own war in the opposite direction. He has been fighting against deflation and keeping interest rates low to reflate the economy. How effective will his campaign be? Very effective, according to this week's guest. He is financial thought leader David Rosenberg, who recently reversed course on his longstanding deflation and bullish bond theme and now predicts inflation will return and interest rates will rise, which would eventually mean a whole new ballgame for investors. Rosenberg is the influential chief economist and strategist for Toronto-based wealth management firm Gluskin Chef. His daily Breakfast with Dave report is considered must-reading by many institutional investors. In his seven years as chief North American economist at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, he was consistently ranked as an all-star analyst by Institutional Investor magazine. I began the interview by asking Rosenberg to explain his new inflation and interest rate outlook and tell us what's changed. Well, there's a few things that have changed. Uh, The first thing I would point to is Fed policy. And, you know, when this uh, secular bull market and bonds uh, began in 1981, we had inflation at 15%. We had bond yields at 15%. Everybody had this well-entrenched inflation psychology. And what people underestimated was this certain individual uh, named Paul Volcker, who took on the role as uh, the head of the Fed and everybody underestimated his radical anti-inflationary resolve and it took him five years, it didn't happen overnight, it took five years and two recessions to finally expunge those inflationary excesses and the inflationary mentality that we had back then. So you fast forward uh, 30 years and... And it worked, incidentally. It worked, well, it it worked maybe too well for this current Fed. Well, what do we have now? We had uh, very recently uh, bond yields, 1.5%, one and a half percent, inflation one and a half percent, but you see we don't have Paul Volcker, we have Ben Bernanke, probably right. followed by Janet Yellen, uh, and we have the most radical pro-reflationary monetary policy in modern history. So I'm going to operate under the assumption uh, that the Fed is going to get what it wants and then some because that's the way that it's always worked in the past. Uh, there's just lags. It took Volcker quite a long time to kill inflation, Uh, I think that with a lag, and the lags are already through the system, uh, the Fed will kill this perceived uh, disinflation or deflationary scare uh, 
uh, over the course of the past several years. What's very interesting to me is that when you go to last December, the Fed put in its press statement, and they've held to this press statement ever since, that they would be willing to tolerate inflation expectations up to 2.5%. So I'm not talking about 5%, 6%, right. 7%, but 2.5%. But, but you see, 2.5% is not price stability. It was just five, six years ago where the people at the Fed were deciding whether or not price stability is 1% underlying inflation. They used to think it was 2%. Now they're saying 25 And that's something new because 2.5%, the price level doubles every 30 years. So the question you have to ask yourself from a fixed income perspective, from somebody like myself who had been very bullish on long-term bonds for right. a long period of and time. And correctly so, well, I might add, yep. Well, you know, bond yields are not four, five, six percent right now. They're basically around, call it, you know, 2.6 percent. Why on earth would you want to own a 2.6 percent coupon on a 10-year treasury note right. uh, and earn practically no premium over inflation whatsoever under the proviso that the Fed ultimately gets what it wants, which is 2.5% inflation. So, so what are the chances, what could prove you wrong? We have stubbornly, you know, stubbornly high unemployment. Uh, we have China slowing. We have a lot of Europe in a recession. We have tightening in the emerging markets like Brazil and India and Indonesia. So, you know, so, so, you know, what is it that's going to bring inflation back? Well, you know, we, we had fairly weak economic growth in the 1970s. In fact, within a span of, what, uh, a decade, we had three recessions, and inflation stayed stubbornly high. And by the way, I'm not talking about going back to the 70s. Uh, not 15% inflation. No, we're not, you know, we're not, we're, Consuela, I'll tell you, we're, we're not going to go back and, uh, and wear bell-bottom jeans, and we're not going to go back and listen to disco music, at Darn. least hopefully. Um, but I think we're going to have a mouth form of stagflation. So here's, here's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Yes, yes, growth is not very strong, although uh, we've had the mother of all fiscal restraints this year between the tax hikes Right. And the sequestering, uh, that's taken about a percentage point and a half out of GDP growth. So, so yes. it would have been higher were it not for those factors. Yeah, when you tack on everything else, we would be close to 3%. So there's only been two other years in the past, actually, where fiscal policy had tightened the degree that it has uh, this year. Uh, both those years landed the economy in recession. And we're not in recession, but growth is weak. I think it's going to get better next year as the fiscal headwinds subside, my hope. I hope it's not a prayer, it's a hope, is that uh, the European recession is behind us. I'm not factoring in a big recovery there, but I think next year is going to be better. And what I find fascinating, and I would say maybe even a little disturbing to some extent, is how is it that just 1.6% real GDP growth in the past year could take the unemployment rate down from 8.1% to just barely over 7% right now. We People have, dropping out of the labor force, so we, a, a shrinking right. pool of labor, shrink, could shrink, that well, do it? That, well, if you take a look at every single measure of unemployment, that we even take that into account, the unemployment rate has come down with just 1.6% GDP growth. You know, during the very strong capital formation years of the 1980s, 1990s, even in the 2000s, if you got 1.6% GDP growth, the unemployment rate went up. It didn't come down. Right. Uh, so that's telling me something about what economists would call the non-inflationary speed potential of the U.S. economy. It used to be during the Greenspan era, when we had tremendous rates of growth and capital formation, tremendous productivity, the economy could grow 4% and not generate much in the way of any inflation. Uh, it wouldn't drain the resources out of the labor market. So I find that very fascinating that such weak growth can drain resources uh, out of the labor market as much as it has. So here's what's happened. In the past five years, we have gone through uh, the weakest pace of capital formation in the private sector at any other point in the past six decades. Wow. With a lag, and I was waiting for this, it has filtered into productivity growth, which, as we sit, is sitting at 0.0%. There's no productivity growth. So companies are having to go increasingly into the labor market right now uh, to tap the labor market to fill their order books, to fill their production. Now, employment's not going gangbusters because growth is fairly slow. Right. But what happens next year if we get towards 3% growth, productivity growth is zero, you've got to tap more labor. We're not talking about 165,000, 175,000 on payrolls. We'll be up to 250, 260, 270. This is per month you're talking about. Right. Is what you and the unemployment will come down even further. Right. And, and yeah, unemployment rate is high, but it is coming down. And with the lag, there will be a wage response. And 70% of the inflation process is wages. So just think about zero productivity growth, wages going up, that means unit labor costs are going to be accelerating, and that trend, by the way, is already in place.
So what, what's interesting about this is because one of the things that, of course, a lot of economists have been looking at, is, as well as government officials, have been is the fact that wages have not increased. And that, you know, there's the, the widening gap between the, the wealthy and the middle class, and the middle class has not made any gains as far as wages are concerned in compensation. Right. So you think that that's going to change, which would be a positive, right, for... Absolutely. For, workers and the average American. I fully agree. So th this is not this is not going to be a forever. This is not a new economy. In fact, we are going to see some improvement. Well, why on earth would anybody resist a forecast like that? The, you know, the thing is that, well, you know, economists, so everything you're telling me, I mean, I've been in this business for 30 years. Right. Uh, and, and economists have a tendency to take the most recent experience and extrapolate it into the future. As do investors. Well, that's not how, and, well, that's not a proper way to forecast. Uh, you have to have a forecast, you have to be able to read the tea leaves, understand how the markets are shifting, understand that there's lags involved. It's not as if the unemployment rate comes down in time X and then in time Y, which is next week, you start seeing the wage response. It'll take time. But yes, my premise is that the labor market operates like any other market and that as capacity is drained out of the labor market and you're seeing, look where jobless claims are right now, they're down to 300,000. Companies are hoarding labor. The number of firings has come way down. Jobless claims are telling you that. We haven't had a normal hiring cycle. If you ever get anything close to a normal hiring cycle with where the level of firings are right now, employment is going to pick up dramatically. And it would be very strange indeed to have the resources drawn out of the labor market and not have the price response. And the price response will be in the form of higher wages. I find it very interesting that you take a look at this cycle, companies, have tremendous cash. There's competing demands for that cash. You know, dividend payouts, nice story for the stock market. Stock buybacks, nice story for investors. Uh, but yet they haven't had to pay their working class. Right. But I think that we are going to see a shift in that direction. Uh, how great would it be, again, if we want to go back to GDP, which is the aggregate demand curve, which is about spending, how great would it be to have a situation where uh, the part of the economy called the corporate sector, which has a 40% savings rate because they're hoarding the cash, right. uh, ends up sharing those spoils with the part of the economy called the consumer sector, which only has a 4% savings rate. So that's going to be, I think, a trigger point for another leg in the economic cycle. But my premise here is that um, productivity growth is going to remain weak. And if productivity growth is weak, that means that you've got to hire more people in order to Right, and, and that's exactly what's happening. To I mean, it, grow your business, and, and it's a, and it's a slow process. You know, on top of that, then you have to run the, cor the correlations as to what drives the inflation process. On this particular topic, so we're talking about supply side economics. Unit labor costs, which is productivity adjusted wages, mm -hmm. has a time worn eighty five percent correlation uh, to inflation. With, to inflation. Now, right. economists will say, well, um, you know correlation does not apply causation, but I think in this case it probably makes sense because wages are such a critical part of overall business expenses. But this is a story of zero productivity growth, to me, is not a deflationary statistic. Mm -hmm. When it's coupled with a tightening labor market, and admittedly the labor, the unemployment rate is high, but it's coming down. And every measure of labor utilization is coming down. I can understand yeah, that the Fed is still concerned about uh, the economy not being where they thought it was going to be, and, and you know, and I'm sure that we'll get into that. But I, I think that, um, that 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 the labor market is going to be a fundamentally positive story next year. And and, and when I go with this story uh, to you know to investors and right. to other you know other very smart people, it's met with derision, and it actually emboldens me because it reminds me when I was making my negative call on housing, uh, which I took no pleasure in doing, by mm -hmm. the way, but when I did that in 2006, when I was at Merrill Lynch... No one believed you. It was the same derision. Right. So it actually, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, again, Bob Farrell, rule number nine, when all the forecasts and experts agree, something else is going to happen. And, and, and that's what I'm talking about. In 1981, the inflation psychology was so well entrenched. We're never going to get rid of inflation. Well, we did. Right. And now we're never going to get rid of the deflation. We're never going to get rid of this unemployment problem. Uh, you know, the, the, there is something very interesting. The dynamic of the labor market is very interesting. We have today a real bifurcated labor market. I guess everything's almost bifurcated today. 90 million American adults reside outside the confines of the traditional Labor, labor force. force. Defined 90 as million. 90 million. That number's up since the recession ended by, by 10 right. million. And, and so, you know, are these kids, went to university, going back, living with mom and dad, 
you know, they figure out, you know, mom's cooking is pretty good after all, and she does the laundry, so maybe right. they'll stick around longer. But maybe that, that comes through with, you know, the fact that the youth uh, have very challenging job prospects, that the student loan problem, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, well, also unemployment benefits, you know, were extended. I mean, there, there well, are all sorts right. of things, right, oh, that allow well, you to oh, be unemployed two years, for longer. Two years of unemployment insurance, right. uh, you know, which would make fishermen in Newfoundland blush. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got widespread benefits. The Cato Institute did a report recently and found that in 39 states, if you tap all the benefits available at the state level and the federal level, uh, that, uh, that you can be actually be without a job and make the same amount of money as a secretary. In, le in 11 states, you'd actually make uh, as much money as, a, uh, as an English teacher. Mm -hmm. So there's work disincentives uh, at play. Um, that's part of it as well. But you know, people talk about you know, that uh, the unemployment rate is going down for, in quotes, the wrong reasons. What does that mean for the wrong reasons? We are creating jobs. Maybe we're creating jobs at the pace, uh, at the pace that the economy can basically absorb at the current time. But this notion is yes, that the participation rate's down to a 35-year low. The question is, why does that matter? The mm -hmm. labor market's the labor market. And so we took 90 million people out. They're outside the labor force. It's basically, if you're talking about the airline industry, we've reduced capacity. Well, you know, that's a big story. We've taken capacity out. The, total pool of available workers is down to a four-year low. Right. Companies are going to have to start tapping that. And it's interesting, what are the jobless claim numbers telling you? We're down to 300,000. What are they telling you? Companies have already, in the past number of years, cut to the bone. Now they want to hang on to their staff because what they, what's left behind in the labor force is the skilled staff. They want right. to hang on to that staff. They haven't gone through a normal hiring cycle yet. I think that's going to be the next part of the story. You take a look at the number of people that are voluntarily quitting their jobs. Uh, so that's 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 now rising, and that's that's now rising. Right. You know, I, I I call that I, I call that the you know to the, the the you know take this job and shove it index, and people are leaving their job, right. and they're going to to find another one, and that's and and so this is all going to factor into higher wages, it's, and believe me, it's not the end of the world. This is actually a very positive story. The thing is that it's met with such widespread disbelief. So impact on the, in, on, on the markets and, and impact on our investment strategy. So th right. this, this would be a sea change that you're talking about. So this is a, a generational shift you're talking about, right? Right. Uh, right. Of, of higher inflation, uh, you know, more jobs. I mean, it's, it's actually a positive for the economy, but what does it do to the markets. Okay, well, we got two things, right? We got the supply side I talked about, I think the wage process, and then we got the Fed. Okay, right. and the Fed, the Fed, you know, we have the to Fed make this- The Fed is still fighting. The Fed's the, fighting, well, you the know, the Fed, the Fed, war. the Fed, the Fed, and the Fed is always fighting the last war. Right. They fought the inflation war, now they're fighting the deflation war, they're fighting the last war. But they want, they, they want to generate inflation. They're telling you, we want inflation up to two and a half percent. I'm going to make the assumption- And employment. Inflation, and they want lower unemployment. Right. Yeah, they, well, they, you know, but, but the thing is that, it was always about price stability. I'm trying to say that, that is no longer the case. They're saying two and a half percent, and then probably it's going to be two and a half percent plus something. And again, it's it's the way that the Federal Reserve is playing ball with the Treasury. Uh, you know, Ben Bernanke gave this famous speech back in uh, the spring of 2003, uh, where he talked about one of the pitfalls in Japan was how the Bank of Japan and fiscal policymakers didn't play ball with each other. When you think about what the Fed is doing, they are de facto monetizing the debt, creating inflation. What a surreptitious way of defaulting. It's not a real default, but it's you reflate your way out of your debts. So look what happened in the cycle. We bailed out the big the banks. The big banks got even bigger. Right. Uh, you know, deadbeat homeowners. Well, we had foreclosure moratoria for them. And now we're basically bailing out Uncle Sam fractionally, uh, moderately, by sanctioning higher inflation. This is a different Fed policy than what we came to grips with over the past 30 years. You know, back in the 1980s, and back even in the 1990s, I was talking to people that were around in the 70s. They were in the trading pits at the big banks. These were my constituents. And all they knew was inflation. All they right. knew was, and I said, it's all you knew was inflation. You don't, because that's, you know, you're just taking the previous economic condition that you grew up with and you're superimposing it on the future. Don't do that. And today, I go and I take a look at the people in the markets today are all these young pups and they've only known, they've only known disinflation. They've only known now deflation. They've never seen inflation because it's been so long. So new ball game then for, for the market. So, so, so what, what's the impact going to be in the market? So, so you know, my, my investment strategy of the last, what, 20 years is not, no longer going to be valid, right? Well, there's going to be, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're, we're going to have a mild form, I would say, of stagflation. 
a mild form of stagflation. It's not the 1970s, but right. it'll be different. So how do you invest around that? Yes. Well, the Fed is going to keep short-term rates lower for longer. They told us that. As we've seen in the past few months, as powerful as the Fed is, they, sorry, they do not control the entire yield curve. They don't control the entire bond market. I think we're going to have so a steeper. So long rates are going up. Yeah, mm -hmm. long rates will continue to drift higher. I mean, right now, they'll probably stay put, but over time, long-term rates will drift up. The Fed will be very slow to raise short-term interest rates. Well, who benefits from a steeper yield curve uh, are the banks uh, because they get wider net interest margins. Insurance companies, which got beaten up so badly by ever declining interest rates, uh, they're going to be doing better. So financials? Financials will be a good place to be. Uh, I would say certainly better than the utilities and the other classic interest rate sensitives, but the banks will have wider net interest margins, so I think that's going to be good for their business. What else? Well, let's, let's say that you want to have inflation hedges in there. I think down the road, uh, basic materials would be a good place to be. I mean, commodities, commodities gold. Uh, they, they should, yeah, they, they, mm -hmm. they should do well in that sort of environment. Right. I would say, uh, you know, what about rising, rising wages? What if we actually get to that holy grail? I mean, people just don't want to believe that we can actually get three percent growth next year, get employment on a more durable basis rising. People don't want to believe it. We haven't seen it in quite a while. I guess people forget that we can actually attain that condition. So, what investments benefit from rising wages? Okay. Well, Obviously, consumers do, and workers do. Bingo. Right. So I would say, well, you know, consumer discretionary retail? services. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'll tell you what we're doing. Uh, retail, you see, retail would be, that's the first reaction. But actually, we're finding opportunities in consumer services. Such as? Well, entertainment, for example, mm -hmm. uh, cable media. Uh, those will be places that will be very interesting to us in this in this uh, in this sort of environment of rising wages, and what do Americans love? Americans love entertainment. Mm -hmm. Okay, some cable media fits into that. I think that the next stage is going to be look. At some point, we're going to have to do more in the business sector to replenish the capital stock. Like as I said before, this has been the weakest period. This is not sustainable. Right. Uh, so I think there's going to be you know once businesses can see that there is visibility on the economy. They'll start uh, spending on and, uh, yeah, and, and equipment, so I, software, well, you tell they, me. They wanna, well, they wanna, you want to protect your margins, you're going to have to reinvest in your business. And so, when I said before about competing challenges uh, for uh, the cash, well, a lot of it's gone towards dividends. I said before, stock buybacks. It hasn't really gone to the real economy. Uh, we have moderately better employment growth, clearly not good enough, not good enough for the Federal Reserve, uh, but we haven't really replaced the capital stock. So that's going to be another stage of the cycle. Uh, so whether you're talking about hardware, software, uh, you know, so first it'll come in the form of consumer services. Uh, hardware, software is going to be a good place to be as well. And I, and I would say that within the bond market, within the bond market, so long as we avert a recession, which I think we will, which means that default rates will remain low, mm -hmm. uh, I think if you're going to be investing in bonds, I'd rather be in, say, corporate credit uh, than in government credit. All right. And, in, you know, SERP. Safety and income at a reasonable price. That's been your investment mantra for, I don't know, 20 years. So, so what's happened to SERP? Uh, well, SERP has morphed into HERP, which is uh, Hedged Inflation Risk Protection. So SERP is, um, you know, SERP is, uh, it's, uh, it's like saying goodbye to an old friend. Right. No, it is. Safety and income. Uh, okay, at a reasonable price is now HERP. So, so tell me what that means again. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about is about, is about inflation. Hedging. Hedges. Yes, right. Uh, you know, I, I would say, for example, one of our strategies is um, we, we are shorting government bonds mm -hmm. and, and buying uh, corporate credit, uh, locking in those spreads. You make money just shorting government bonds in a rising yield environment. As I said before, the banks are, are good hedges to be, insurance companies, and a play on hard assets. A play on hard assets. And that can include, for example, can include real estate, can include commodities. Hedge inflation risk protection. All right. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have all of us own some of in a diversified portfolio? Well, uh, I think right now uh, one of our top themes is exactly what I was talking about before, which is what is the source of the inflation? The source of the inflation is coming out of the labor market, higher wages. Uh, so we want to find those small luxuries that the American consumer uh, you know, wasn't participating in over the past few years. Uh, so we are allocating more of our equity money into that particular part of the retail space, otherwise known as cable and media. That's considered to be a luxury, not Cartier, not... <laughs> <laughs> I said small luxuries. Small luxuries. All right, Dave Rosenberg, number one, thank you so much for being here on Wealth Talk again. I, you've got a big audience out there. And, thank you. and also, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your, this big call that could be a, a, the change of a generation. So I appreciate your being here on Wealth Track. Thank you again for inviting me.
At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. Our action point is consider David Rosenberg's new HERP investment theme, which stands for Hedge Inflation Risk Protection. Rosenberg is frequently early in spotting important turns in the economy and markets, but he is rarely wrong. So it is worth making some small adjustments to your portfolio now. Adding some inflation hedges, such as the much vilified tips, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, if you don't already have them, is a good place to start. Well, next week, we will sit down with one of the investment world's most original and thought-provoking money managers, AQR Capital Management's Cliff Asnes, on why we need to use the three dirty words of finance in our portfolios. In the meantime, to see past WealthTrack interviews, please go to WealthTrack.com. And while you are there, visit our extra feature for exclusive insights from our guests, as well as some of their best research. And feel free to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter for WealthTrack updates. In the meantime, have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter. <laughs>